And, but some of them are honest enough to admit it. I mean, Paul Bremer, the viceroy of Iraq, it comes easily when you come from South Asia to see these things. <laughs> so Bremer came and spoke to Congress about, you know, look, this is what we've been doing. This is how far we've come. And he said, master, it's almost British understatement. He said, some people are starting to chafe at the presence of foreign troops in the streets. Starting to chafe. Three, four, five, six Americans are being killed every day, you know? 40, 50, 60 Americans are being wounded every week. Bombs are going off in central Baghdad. They're using mortar rounds to attack the buildings in which US troops live. And this is chafing. What do they do when they get serious? <laughs> but it's just, and, and he says, he goes on, some people, says Bremer, are starting to see us as occupiers and not as liberators. <laughs> so you know, some recognition of what's going on is there. But, there is an important element of empire, and that is your notion of your own power and your own capability. That when your goal is to make the world not just safer and better, and you think that you have unprecedented and unequaled strength and influence, you really do think you can sort this out. And so you have Cheney and Rumsfeld on television day after day saying, this will pass. It'll settle down, it'll give in. Historically, people haven't given in. Otherwise, we'd still be living under the Roman Empire or something, right? But they know that this is a moment of influence, and even that influence is not complete. Now, one of the things when you pay attention to how they think about what they're going to do with their empire is that the first concern, as US defense planning documents have made clear for a decade, especially those written for Cheney and Wolfowitz under the first Bush administration. Those planning documents 10 years ago, soon after the end of the Cold War, talked about that the predominant goal of the United States, the dominant consideration, they said, is to prevent the rise of a potential rival. In other words, in our shadow, no new empire will be allowed to grow. And how are they going to do this? They, they explain where they think power comes from. And they say that we must endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region. I'm not talking about dominating the world, from dominating a region whose resources would, under consolidated control, be sufficient to generate global power. In other words, this is how we got ours, and we're going to make sure nobody else does this to us. So keep other powers down, keep them as regional powers, B, control access to resources so that no one else ever has the capacity to challenge us, and therefore there will be no global rivals. Therefore, this empire will last forever. So you have these people talking about a new American century, and then presumably there will be another American century after that, and so on. But the part of it that is about force is the easy part to understand about empire. It's the part about where I started out that Doyle talks about, about collaboration and social, economic, and cultural dependence. That's the hard part. That's one of the reasons why empires do grow in the shadow of empires. Because for, in lots of cases that we see, what seems to happen is that the process of collaborating and engaging with somebody who comes in and takes over with an imperial power is that you start to think like them. And that starts to shape even your notions of what kinds of ways you have to resist them. Now, no one captured this better than Gandhi. In his political manifesto, Hind Swaraj, he has this wonderful discussion of uh, the nature of Indian nationalism. It's written in the form of a dialogue between Gandhi as the editor and some anonymous Indian nationalist as the reader. And Gandhi says, what kind of India do you want? This is written in the 1920s, so way before Indian independence. Gandhi asks, what kind of independence do you want? And he has the nationalist reply, I want an India that has a strong army and a great navy and that will be a force in the world. And Gandhi says, 
So you want an India that is like Britain, but without the British. <laughs> and unfortunately, history seems to suggest that Indian nationalism won out over Gandhi because you know, they've tested nuclear weapons, they, want, they have ballistic missiles, and India, like many other post-colonial states, shows all the characteristics in terms of its priorities and its exercises of power domestically and internationally, the same kinds of resorts to force, violence, domination, appropriation of resources from those who are weaker than you, minority communities, indigenous communities, people who depend for their livelihoods on small ecosystems, that it is an act of building and accumulating and sustaining power by dispossession and force. But the thing, you know, things get even more complicated than that. Because those who collaborate and those who allow this dependence to function benefit from it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Because empire, like the exercise of most kinds of power, often depends on a balance of consent as opposed to coercion. You, know, you don't want to have to beat people over the head all the time. You want them to actually agree. That reduces the price that you have to pay to get what you want. And ultimately, the goal is to get them to be so deferential and to buy into your value system so completely, resistance becomes meaningless. Why would you want to resist? And that's the goal. Now, this has been explored, especially by some you know, very insightful Indian writers and thinkers, especially Ashish Nandi, who wrote about colonialism, and he called it the intimate enemy. And he says that the most enduring consequence of being subject to imperialism is actually you lose your sense of self. Because you can't imagine the world other than through the perspectives of those who rule you because they make your world. And this is a profound challenge for anybody that talks about undoing empire, transforming empire, ending empire, or doing anything with empire except practicing empire. That, of course, raises the very hard question then of what do you do about empire if you decide you're not going to practice it? And you know, the first thing, of course, is to say no to empire, but then what? Because in one sense, you can't undo empire. A better word may be to recover from empire. And it's not just those who are the subjects of empire, but those who are the citizens of empire, those who benefited, benefited from empire, those for whom the exercise of power and domination and the creation of dependence brought benefits. For them to get empire out of their system is not an easy thing. And for a global empire like the United States, getting empire out of the minds and souls of Americans is going to be a huge and historically unprecedented task. But there are interesting contradictions within an empire that means that it's possible to believe that we can get somewhere away from where we are. One of the ways of getting people to consent to empire is to teach them to think like you are. So in 1835, Lord Macaulay, who's a very famous Englishman responsible in part for managing India, wrote a letter, a minute on education, in which he described the role of the British and of education in ruling India. And he said, our goal is not to rule India. It is to make Indians fit to rule themselves. And he went on to talk about what we want is Indians who, while not British in blood and color, but are British in sensibility and outlook. So then you don't need to rule them anymore because they'll rule you as if you were ruling them. 